Testing, testing. One, two, three. Testing, testing. Do, do, do. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, if someone wouldn't mind telling me something in the chat, just so that I know that, uh, I know, I know that you guys know that the chat's fine, but, you know, it's a bit of a sanity check for me. Um, only 22 people. Wow, that's, oh, 23. That's okay. All right, 23 was, like, the number I was going for, so now that we have 23 everything, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, <clears throat> so, y'all expect or wondering if I'm going to talk about the announcement that I put up over Avenue just this morning. Um, one of your colleagues, chat doesn't work, oh no, okay. I'll have to try to fix it then. Um, one of your colleagues uh, over the course of, I think it was yesterday, posted something to Piazza, which is, I think, useful to bring up um, for you guys. The um, there, there was a rather long and detailed um, analysis that this character posted. Um, I use the word character in the best sense. Um, that demonstrates pretty clearly that if you write the algorithm as it's intended to be written, that um, the um, what you get as a result mismatches uh, the number of swaps that I had published in the assignment. Uh, with respect to the number of swaps for test case 1 and test case 2. The actual number is this number, so this student was correct. I had made a error um, in my solution to this problem. Unfortunately, it happens, uh, especially when you're trying to build a curriculum from scratch. So it turned out that my my sorting algorithm was actually skipping this step. It was going straight to the zero sort instead of doing the one sort, then the zero sort. So, um, I have made the uh, adjustments that I needed to make to the assignment file. Um, I have sort of re-released the assignment file. There's a procedure for getting it. But if you'd like the new version of the assignment file that has the correct numbers in the actual assignment file itself, um, that's available on Avenue. And it's also available on JupyterHub if you completely delete the folder that assignment 3 is in and then re-fetch it. Um, I... We have, a, we have a clever way of adjusting the test cases post-submission, so I don't think we'll need to... Uh, it won't matter one way or the other which of those two documents you submit. I'm going <coughs> to... Pardon me. Kind of how it works is that um, when you... When I um, generate the assignment, the generation process uh, removes all of the hidden test cases from the release version, stores that information in a database, and then that information is like in, inserted back into your assignments um, uh, post fact. It's not like hidden in the file somewhere, it just doesn't exist. So um, it won't matter which, uh, which version your submission is based on, this updated version or the older version, because the test cases are going to be coming from the database anyway. So don't worry too much about that. Um, there are a couple of other points, sort of general points, with respect to auto-grading that uh, Mark has asked me to talk to you guys about. Um, so, and he... I think is going to talk maybe to you guys in the tutorial about it or tell the, t the other TAs about it. Or The information is going to come to you in some form or another. Um, so we had a sort of, we had our first real world test of our auto grading software that we're working on uh, that we 
uh, we, we ran it on assignment two, and this worked for about 90% of assignments, but uh, the remaining 10%, there were some um, issues. Uh, the auto grader basically uh, didn't work for them, uh, and there are, are a couple of reasons for this. Sometimes it's... Uh, so, so let me explain the structure of how the auto grader works a little bit to you guys. Uh, what it actually does is where you see in the um, in the assignment sort of um, template, the question template, there are these tags that say um, precondition tag and postcondition tag. Um, the auto grader will actually insert code of our design at those points in the code, and um, one of the, like the post condition is an assert statement. Assert statements, if you don't know, will cause the program to um, stop on an error if the condition that is put into the assert statement isn't met. So it's like a, it's like a Boolean condition, just like an if statement. Um, we use, uh, so the manner in which your, your, your work is actually, um, executed. It's not executed within the Jupyter environment. That was very problematic. Um, this is like, if it were executable within the context of the Jupyter Notebook, then the regular auto grader would work and nothing would be a problem and everybody would be happiness and roses. Um, and all of this would have been unnecessary. So what it actually does is it takes your answer code, it sort of pulls it out of your Jupyter Notebook, it inserts the code that we use to test your code into that, writes that into a C file into the um, working directory, uh, executes it, uh, or compiles it using GCC, and then executes it. So there are a couple of reasons that you might fail a test case. You would fail a test case if your code doesn't actually compile. Now, this can be the result of you making a syntax error, like omitting a semicolon or something like that. Um, but it turns out that we actually ran into a new class of error with this that um, we hadn't predicted could exist, shall we say. Um, that type of error is a namespace conflict between variables that you declare and variables that we declare in our uh, testing code. So obviously it's a syntax error if you declare the variable x twice, right? So anywhere that occurred, we ran into problems. So the solution to that, we're working on a code solution to that. Uh, we're working on adapting the auto grader to be able to handle that um, case. However, it is unlikely that we're going to be able to get that out before assignment three is going to be collected. So I don't care you can use the main function to test your code in the manner in which you would test your code naturally. You know, please do so. Don't submit untested code. But for your final submission, if you guys wouldn't mind deleting all of the code from your main functions except for those tags. Leave the tags in because the tags are necessary for us to know the insertion point for our code. But, um... If you could please just delete everything from main. Um, although, I, uh, hypothetically, another way that you could do it, which um, would work, is if you had main call some other function, and if the, if the naming conflict... Like, if you declare all of the, the variables that you want to use to test your code, if you declare them in a separate function, in a separate namespace from main, then there would be no conflict, so it wouldn't be a problem. Um, but... Uh, as it exists, the namespace problem um, persists. We haven't fixed it yet, so if you could just delete everything from main except for the except for those tags, then that would be that would be good. That would mean that we have to do less manual work in order to get the um, the auto grader to work. And it's not like um, it's not like if you do that, then you end up with like your work being graded exclusively manually like in the manner it was graded in assignment one uh we just like we we try to 
fix your code and then, you know, run your code and see if the test cases come out. Basically, we do the auto grading manually, um, if that makes sense. But yeah, so that's something to be aware of. Um, the other thing to be aware of is this question here uh, raises an interesting point. Can you change the inputs to a function that's required in the question? And the answer is no, 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 no. Please no, God no, no, no. Um, please don't do that. Um, the parameters, uh, in order to test the function that you're writing, our code that we write for the auto grader needs to assume that your code is following the function prototype that's been provided in the question template. If you start modifying the, um, the parameters, if you start mod modifying the arguments or reordering them or doing stuff like that, then that's going to cause problems for the auto grader, which means that you're not going to get marks. And I'm kind of inclined to say you don't deserve any marks if you do that. Um, kind of like you don't deserve any marks if you have a syntax error. Because it's ridiculous for you to submit code that has a syntax error. Sorry, I just said it. But anyway, I have a few questions, um, and I'm going to look at those questions now. Will the solutions to, be, to A1 be posted somewhere? Um, the solutions to A1 are, uh, they don't actually exist, so it would be difficult to post them somewhere. Um, I'll see if I can get Parker to whip something up for you guys. Question, if the auto grader fails, do you man manually mark the assignments or is it just zero? So, in the... So I assume you're referring to the 10% of assignments that I was referring to that um, that the auto grader failed on. Um, so these are actually, at this point, going to manual grading. But the manual grading that's occurring is just trying to reconstitute the functionality of the auto grader, if that makes sense. So the idea is we, the, the TAs are grading manually, but they are doing it in such a manner that the output would be the same as if the uh, the auto grader had worked on that uh, on that question. Uh, for example, another another problem that we've been running into with respect to um, another problem we've been res uh, we've been trying to work through with respect to the auto grader not working for certain things is um, infinite loops. So. If your code that you submit has an infinite loop in it, right now that makes the auto grader hang, and you know it's a it's we're we're working on a fix for it, but that's an example of something that you would get a zero for that makes the auto grader hang. An example of something you wouldn't get a zero for that makes the auto grader hang is including a scanf statement. So when you use scanf, the function uh, like the whole execution is paused while it waits for input from standard input. Uh, since this is being run by a program, uh, nothing's coming in over standard input, so it just halts. Um, we would appreciate it if you didn't use scanf in main, um, or at all. <laughs> uh, for the, like, you can, for the purposes of testing, go right ahead, but um, for, for your final submission, please remove any scanf um, functions. Again, we're working on a, a solution for this that means less work for you guys, but, um, you know, that's kind of the current state of affairs. Um, if there is an external variable with the same name, won't it cause a similar problem? Um, no, because the, the way that the variable scoping works is that you are always referring to the most local version of whatever the uh, variable name is. So, for example... Um, if you have an external variable x and an automatic variable x within the context of the automatic variables declaration, the function or main or whatever, uh, you'll refer to x unless otherwise stated. Um, unless x has been declared as an external variable within the function. So we're okay in that case. Um, which will be the last lecture to contain content that will be on our midterm next week? 
Um, actually, that was yesterday. That's a good question. Thank you. So you guys have a midterm coming up next week. Um, I definitely try to make a habit for my courses of not testing anything that's covered the week of the test. So, um, so this lecture, this topic six, this will not be on the test. This will be on the next test. Um, so just to confirm, the auto grader essentially just takes the name of the function and puts random inputs, as in as long as the function exists and, and works, it's fine, because in 1D04 there was a specific template we had to follow. Um, yes. Um, so if I get the essence of your question, um, how the, so yeah, the auto grader, so let me, let me run through a concrete example of this um, for you guys. Please try not to use this knowledge to try to hack the auto grader. We had a, a student in 1MD3 that managed to successfully hack the auto grader, and unfortunately that student published the hack publicly uh, on the Piazza forum, which means that pretty much anybody who uses um, Jupyter for Python now has this huge vulnerability and like we've been scrambling for 1MD3 to try to fix that problem um, and like produce counter code that counters this very uh, stupid and easy exploit. Um, but anyway, no, so let me run through the concrete, in concrete terms, how the auto grader um, would work uh, in the case of the shell sort algorithm. So the shell sort algorithm takes um, it takes the array to be sorted, the size of the array to be sorted, the array of gaps, and a function, uh, a subsorting function, right? So, in order, the test case that tests to see that the array, that the array actually gets sorted, right? Um, I'm actually declaring two helper functions inside of main, so inside of main's namespace in order to be able to perform that. One of those helps or helper functions is the um, array comparison. Uh, like, you know, two arrays, are they, they the same array? There's a function that does that. And there's another function that um, is the subsort that's used. Uh, so you don't have to worry, for example, of preserving the bubble sort algorithm that exists in the global namespace for um, for the shell sort function because I'm actually instantiating uh, a subsort function inside of main itself that is being passed into the function. So you don't have to worry uh, about that. It's kind of the the testing code is carrying with it everything it needs to perform the test. So what happens is the well, actually, there, there's another array that's declared in there, which is kind of the solution. So we have the raw array, we have the solution array, right, that are declared within, the, within main. Um, the function is executed, uh, you know, in the manner that you would typically call a function. And then the assert statement is based on the output of the array comparison function. So, um, you know, array one is compared to array two. If they're the same, then it returns a true, and if it's they're uh, if they're not the same, then it returns a false, and that is passed into the assertment statement. If you get a true, then it passes through uh, execution without producing an error, and that is considered a, te a passed test case. If uh, if the result of that function return value, uh, pardon me, if the function return value is false then that false gets passed um, into the assert function, which generates an error that, that halts the execution of your program, ex uh, of the generated executable on an error, and um, that's picked up uh, using a, um, I think, a shell script, although we may have moved the shell script into Python more specifically at this point. It used to be a shell script that, like, compiled and executed, and then it just passed on, you know, basically a boolean value this worked or something went wrong if something went wrong then you got uh, zero for however many points that test case is worth and if 
you got, you know, one, then you got however many points that test case is worth. We generally don't write test cases that are more than worth more than two marks. So, hopefully that illuminates the process. Um, I will ask right now if there are any further questions about anything like that, anything at all, um, you know, any questions about marking the course, the test, you know, general questions about the course, philosophical questions, you know, anything? Anybody got any questions? If not, I will move along. Incidentally, um, I figured out what was wrong with my why, with my webcam. I just needed to restart Linux, and that was it. And now I'm back. Although I can also, I I, I, I can shift the hue for you guys if you if you want. I because uh, that's a fun thing. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions, so let's move on with our lecture material for today. Thank you very much for your time. Um, dealing with all of that stuff. I know, like... Oh, there's a question. There's a question. Blue hue. All right. We shall be blue today. Blue. I'm blue. If I was green, I would die. If I was green, I would die. If I was green, I would die. Is that what you're talking about? That's a song. Hmm. This is fun. Cool. All right. So. Uh, so we talked about pointers. We've talked about pointers for a while. Hopefully you guys are getting the idea uh, with pointers. There was... There's some stuff now that we're going to sort of shift into that is um, less abstract, less mathematical. This is more like nuts and bolts programming. And we're going to be doing this for a little while. Um, topic 6, this is a draft of Topic 6. If you'd like to follow along on your own home computer, uh, if you would like to follow along on your home frog computer, then... Um, I've uploaded a draft version of these slides to um, to Avenue, so we'll see how we do. But this is these slides are based on chapters eight, nine, and eleven of the Deedle book. Um, so, in terms of the general layout of the course uh, so far, we have done uh, basically up to chapter seven of the textbook. Uh, relatively in the order in which it's presented. However, uh, I sort of, I have the, I have made the observation that chapters eight, nine, and eight and nine basically deal with very, very similar material, uh, and chapter eleven is about file I/O, which is also very similar material. So to me, it makes sense to group all of that material together. Um, after we're finished with this topic, we will have topic 7, that will be about structures, unions, bit manipulations, and enumerations, although that's a lot of different topics, um, and then we will probably cover some of the more advanced algorithm stuff that is covered in chapters, um, chapter 12, uh, dealing with things like trees and queues and uh, stacks and linked lists and all those nice and lovely things. Um, so, and then once we're finished with that, there is sort of, there'll be a final chapter, topic eight, on preprocessor commands. And uh, sort of, there's a miscellaneous, uh, chapter 14 is like miscellaneous topics in C. So we'll cover that stuff. And then, once we've covered all of that, we will have actually covered the entirety 
of this textbook, uh, which deals with the C programming language. After that, we will, uh, after chapter 14, in two more topics, we will have covered C in its entirety, at least according to this textbook. Uh, so, there you go, complete coverage. That would be an excellent goal. So you might be saying to yourself, well, hypothetically, you know, we're supposed to cover a topic a week, and if these topics, even if these topics take four lectures each, uh, rather than the three lectures they're supposed to be, as has been the case for the last couple of them, um, we're still only looking at um, four weeks of class left, which is about a month. Uh, so what are we going to do for the remaining remainder of the course? And the answer to that is, it is necessary for accreditation purposes over the course of this course that we uh, introduce two other languages. We're going to introduce uh, C++. Um, so C++ is a thing we're going to do a little bit. Uh, we're not going to do a huge amount of C++. Um, fortunately, C++ is largely based on C. Um, it's like C with other stuff, you know, C++, if you will. Um, <laughs> and um, if you... Um, stick around with us till the very end, we're going to do a topic about a, a, maybe a week's worth on assembly programming. Um, so we're going to look up in terms of abstraction and we're going to look down in terms of abstraction. So that's, uh, that's like roughly your roadmap for the rest of the course. Ha. But let's actually get to topic six. So. We are going to talk about strings, formatting, and file I.O. Nuts and bolts stuff. So, we're going to build some character. We're going to learn ternary expressions. We're going to be destringing and restringing. And we're going to learn string manipulations. So, here's a quick recap of what it means to be a string. In, str in C, strings are encoded as character arrays, which are null terminated. So, it, for example, if we have the declaration of the string bar uh, and uh, the declaration of the character array foo, uh, in the above declaration, foo will be written into memory as b a r null. Each one of these characters is 8 bits in width. Remember, all strings are arrays of chars which have a bit width of 1 byte. Uh, chars have a bit width of one byte, not the uh, arrays. Strings are delimited with double quotes, and characters are delimited with single quotes. I have a question. So if you get some points deducted for a question, does that mean your code failed some test case but worked for the rest? Yeah, so for example, um, generally speaking, um, okay, so I'll answer the first question first. Uh, normally, um, the test cases test different things. Uh, normally, I, uh, I write it, like, I write a test case into every problem that, like, gives you one mark just for code, uh, just for your code compiling, right? Uh, it doesn't actually invoke your function or anything, it's just does this code have any syntax errors? If you manage to write something that has no syntax errors, then it's it's like the it's like the well you tried marks. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes, like an infinite loop, for example, will only pop up if your code is actually run. So you know, if you get some marks for a question, it means um, yeah, some. Some of your test cases worked and others of your test cases didn't. So, and Nicholas asks a very philosophical question. Uh, why are all the examples foo and bar? And the answer to that is I, I, nobody really knows. Nobody is quite sure why foo and bar are used. They are very conventional in the uh, study of programming languages and the... Um, um, 
the study of programming languages and um, like like the Fu and Bar actually date super 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 early as variable names in the history of computing. Basically, as soon as you have the ability to name variables, as soon as you start having symbolic variables, the names Fu and Bar show up in computing history. Um, the closest I could get to it was that uh, I heard like a story which is unverified that one of the people at MIT that developed these things like developed programming languages had a model train set in his uh, in his basement that had like switches labeled foo and bar um, however it is unclear whether the model train set influenced the pro the um, the names foo and bar as variable names or the variable names influenced the model train set. It is also possible that foo and bar are um, adaptations of military slang. Um, in, militar in military slang, uh, the um, F-U-B-A-R um, is an acronym that stands for uh, effed up beyond all reason, uh, which is, you know, there you go. Uh, so it's possible that f uh, foo and bar are foo bar um, separated into two, and putting f o o uh, is a little bit more um, you know um, p g rated than just putting f u as your <laughs> as your variable names. But it's a it's a very old and long standing convention. This is unlikely to be the f the last course that you see foo and bar in. Um, Yes. <laughs> well, it's interesting, right? Like, you have to keep in mind that uh, in the period when programming languages were being developed, like, you're talking about the 1950s and 60s, the immediate post-war period, so military slang would have been much more... Uh... <laughs> That's a good wisdom. Uh... Yes, I've seen. I watch the internet memes. I'm a cool professor. Anyway, we should actually learn. So, introducing a library for character operations. Many useful operations on characters are stored in ctype.h, one of C's standard libraries. Each function receives an in. Uh, we're basically going to go through a bunch of library functions. Um, this is like going through standard libraries, the lecture slides. So, each function receives an unsigned char represented as an int, or an end of file command as an argument. EOF means end of file and is typically used to indicate the end of a file in your file system. We'll see more EOF type stuff when we do file IO. Uh, EOF typically has a memory value of negative one, although this is somewhat dependent on your operating system. Basically, the particular value of EOF is defined in some file somewhere in your operating system, and that's just what's used. Uh, some, pe some operating systems use negative one, but it doesn't really matter as long as it's used consistently. So, let's talk about character predicates. A predicate is a term in mathematical logic, meaning a function returning a Boolean value. You'll thank me, you'll thank me, like, in a year or two for having introduced you to the term predicate. Particularly if you do, um, I think it's 3K03 um, with Dr. Wassing. If Dr. Wassing's still teaching it. So, um, so if you have a function and it returns a Boolean, that's called a predicate. It's a term from mathematical logic. The functions below, uh, these functions here, return true for the indicated characters and false otherwise. So, we have is blank. We can tell if a character is blank, blank being defined as either uh, the space that is mapped to spacebar or a tab character. Is digit is uh, will return true for the ASCII digit values 0 through 9. Is alpha is 
lowercase and uppercase letters. Is alnum. It, alnum stands for alphanumeric. Um, alphanumeric characters are the ones indicated on the above two lines, so obviously they are alphabetic characters or numeric characters. Is X digit. So is hexadecimal digit. So this is the numeric characters plus A through F in either upper or lower case. Is upper, obviously the uppercase alphabetics. Is lower, the lowercase alphabetics. Uh, is space. Uh, space is more uh, sort of loosely defined than blank. It's um, the two blank characters plus new line, vertical tab, um, feed, and carriage return. These ones are interesting because they're only uh, applicable to typewriters, yet they're still in ASCII. So if you imagine uh, uh, an electric typewriter, uh, in order to, in order, like, the way that a typewriter works is, like, there's one point at which uh, letters are typed onto the side, typed onto the page, and as they are typed onto the page, the page is moved until you hit the end of the page, and then the carriage returns, and then you try again. Uh, so there's actually a character in ASCII for carriage return that dates back to teletype machines. Um, is control is control characters. A control character is essentially anything with a slash in front of it. Um, is punctuation is printed characters other than alphanumerics and spaces. So we here uh, have to delve into the difference between a printed character and a graphic character or a graph character. Uh, we have predicates for this as well. Printed characters are anything that gets printed to the screen. So obviously all of the characters that I just highlighted are printed characters, including ones that uh, don't print a character, but like print a space. Those are also printed characters. If, it's, if the effect of the character is visible on the screen, then it's a printed character. You can, again, you can kind of think of it in terms of teletype machines. Like a carriage return, that's not printed, right? That's an operation on the, tele on the uh, typewriter rather than uh, uh, something the typewriter types. Um, so, um, null is an example of a character which is not printed, for example. Um, any character which is printed to your monitor is a printed character. The null character is an example of a non-printed or graph character. You can always test for specific characters using equality. So these these give you like categories of characters, but you know you can always test individual ones as well. I have a question. Is there a special header file for these? Yes, it is ctype.h. Ta-da! If you wish to use these functions, you must use ctype.h. Ta-da! So. Oh, there you go. The ctype.h standard library includes two functions, uh, at least two functions, <laughs> which transform characters from one form to another. Int to lower, int c, accepts a character and returns the lowercase version if the character has one. And int to upper, accepts a character and returns the uppercase version if the character has one. So... It's not like this. Um, it's not like this function will fail if, for example, the character is already uppercase. Um, this makes it really easy if you, for example, want to convert a string to being all uh, all capitals. Then you would just apply to upper to each element of the string uh, sequentially because if it's if it cannot be converted to an uppercase letter, then that character is mirrored back to you. It has made the return value. In both cases, if the corresponding upper lowercase uh, character does not exist, the character is returned unchanged. There you go. So, and now for something completely different. Let's talk about the ternary operator. This doesn't really have to do with characters, but it's about time we talked about the ternary operator. Um, so, if statements are 
uh, if statements are statements, right? You write them like statements. They all get their own line. The ternary, a ternary expression, is an if expression. So rather than requiring its own line and require, you know, it, rather than requiring its own line, the ternary expression is inserted in line inside of, you know, anywhere an expression is acceptable. So if statements are great, but somewhat clunky, there must be a better way. The above sta if statement may be expressed in one line using the ternary operator. So, if b x equals y, else x equals z. x is equal to b question mark y colon z. So, the way that you interpret a ternary operator is if b then y, else z. Question. All of the functions take an int and return an int. Yes, I know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, you would expect them to take char, but there's probably some, like, there's probably some obscure uh, historical reason for the fact that they don't. Um, obscure historical reasons that I don't know. <laughs> um, sorry. So, ternary is a trinary operator. So, unary operators take one op argument, binary operators take two arguments, trinary operators take three arguments. B is a Boolean expression, such as a condition. Y is an expression, and is the result if B is true. Z is an expression, and the result if B is false. The ternary operator is an expression, not a statement, and so may be used in any place an expression is allowable. This includes such interesting and diverse areas as the declaration of constants. This includes places where you can't even have an if statement, such as uh, within the global namespace. Um, you can in, you can use ternary expressions inside of um, indexing operations. You can use ternary expressions inside of the argument uh, inside of the uh, space where you put a, you would put an argument to a function. So there are some things you can do with ternaries that you can't do with if, if statements. Um, However, it's also, there are occasions where the ternary operator makes your code more readable as well. So if you are the type of person who obsesses uh, over making your lines of code as small as possible, um, this is the operator for you. Incidentally, there is no advantage in terms of runtime to using ternary over if statements. Um, I believe there used to be, but there is no longer. That, um, that gap has been closed by compiler optimization. Whether or not they improve readability seems to be a matter of taste. So, in some cases, they make it more readable. In other cases, they make it more dense and therefore less readable. Um, however, one might say that if you have a long sequence of if statements that are unconnected, uh, and our simple assignments, it might be more readable to have a series of ternary expressions uh, inside of assignment statements rather than having all these clunky if statements. But yeah, so there you go. So, null termination. The null character has a very important function in C. This is kind of a review again. You may have noticed that C does not know when an array ends, although it will always know where one begins because it point the uh, array, uh, the array identifier is a pointer to the beginning of the array. The null character, oop, that should be on one line. The null character slash zero is used to indicate the end of a string in all standard 
library functions. This is universally the case. Using the fact of null termination in your own code is also a very good idea. So if the standard library is assuming strings are null terminated, then you can assume strings are null terminated as well. A common pitfall is not allocating enough space in your character array for the null character. If a string is missing its null character, the functions in the standard library, standard string library will continue into memory space not allocated to the character array. This will introduce smelly garbage data into your program and may even cause a sug fault. So just like um, you can imagine if bubble sort didn't specify the size and it was looking for a particular character to be at the end of the array to indicate the end of the array, kind of like the H gaps in the shell sort algorithm, your the one care the uh, the integer one is always going to be the last element. Then um, if that character is missed, then you will just continue on into um, into unallocated memory space. So, question. Does that mean that ternary can't be used for more than just if and else? So does it do else ifs is the question. Well, um, yeah, I mean, it can do, sure, uh, yes. Uh, but it has to make use of the fact that um, you can nest expressions, right? So get it, um, ternary.c, sure, boobaloo doop. So if we had include stdio.h int main x is equal to um, you know condition b1 um, say 7 condition b2 um, 8, 9. So this is in fact equivalent to if b1 x is equal to um, if b2 x is equal to 8, else, like, else ifs are not fundamentally distinct from sequences of else's and ifs, right? It's just a, it's just a thing to not have to nest them quite so much. So, x is equal to 7. So, if you were to take, uh, I, I did it the wrong way around, but if you, if you took this, right, and you swapped these two guys then you would end up with this and this my friends is that So there you go. That's how you do else ifs using ternary. Oh yeah, it does need a data type. Yep, for sure. There you go. Um, yeah, like B1 is also not like a thing that exists. So, you know, this was kind of... I never meant to compile this even though I put it in the file. Eh. All right. Good. Oh my goodness. I hate it when I do that. So. We'll see if we can do this slide in one minute. <laughs> so, the C standard library stdlib.h defines str to d, which converts a decimal numbers uh, to double precision floating point numbers or doubles. I should say 
encoded as strings. So this is the type declaration, uh, the function prototype, sorry. So it returns a double. It takes a constant char string and a char end pointer, char double char end pointer. So str is a pointer to the string to be converted. Leading white space is ignored. str2d converts as much of the string as it can to a to double format and then returns that double. End pointer is the address where uh, str2d string to double stores the address of the character that it stopped on. So it goes as far as it can as long as you're talking about valid a valid number, it just continues. As soon as it hits something that breaks that, it stops, it returns the double, and it sets end pointer to whatever character it stopped at. This is an example of a function using pointers to, in effect, return two values. One is an explicit return value, one is an implicit return value. The double, which is the result of the conversion, is the explicit return value. The implicit one is the um, the address of the point in the array or in the character array uh, that you stopped at. So there you go. Um, and then we're going to do an example, but we're going to do it next time. And by that, I mean next week. Uh, so I will stay on for a little while to uh, answer any questions that you may have about anything that has to do with anything. And if you would like to ask me questions, please do so. Otherwise, please have a good weekend. Um, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Um, yeah, anyway. Cool. Why is it taking char and returning a double. It's not taking a char, it's taking a char star, right? It's taking a string and returning a double. So this will be a little bit more um, obvious next time, but uh, if you consider this string, 51.2% are admitted, um, and then we create a string pointer, we then invoke str2d over this string, and then it uh, it takes the character five one point and two, converts that to a double precision floating point number, and returns that to D. That's now stored in D. So you can see that we use D as a floating point number displaying two decimal places uh, in the printf. And I know that like doing this, we're kind of like converting from a string to a double and then back into a string again, so we could print it. But you know. That's what this lecture slide is. That's what these lecture slides are going to be like. It's very nuts and boltsy type stuff. Yeah. So to answer this question, um, it just points to the final character in the string pointer, which it converts. No. So in this example, um, it points to the last element that it, uh, that it it points to the first element that's not a part of the number. So in this case, it's 51.2. That's number. As soon as it hits the percent sign, it's like, oh, that's not a number. So you notice how it's give, we're giving it the address of string pointer here, right? So this is a double pointer, right? So when we look at string pointer, we can consider that to be a string itself, right? Because a pointer to characters is a character array. So we then print that string, which is pointed to by string pointer, and it's printed right here. So you can see the rest of the string is percent are admitted, right? Maybe that makes sense? Um, I got 103, so, yeah. Yeah, I think 103 is correct. Okay, 
so that seems to be all of the questions. Um, thank you very much, guys. I'll see you next week. Oh, more and more questions. One final question. Well, those are the same age gap sequence, so I don't know what to tell you, man. Cool. Anyway, take her easy, folks.